There's no doubt um, that the world economy is in some sort of trouble right now. From the subprime crisis and the expanding credit crisis that came out of that, through to company bankruptcies, job cuts, the world's definitely a different place now than it was two years ago. Nobody's in any disagreement about that. But where the disagreement arises is over the severity of the current crisis and whether or not this crisis is in some way the worst thing that we've seen since the 1930s. And if we have a look at this, um, ta this table here, we can see some of the, um, the, the results of the 1929 crash. And across here is the months from the start of the crisis. And the white line is, is the depression starting in June 1929. And the yellow line is the current crisis as of April 2008. So when we look at it like that, you, know, you can obviously see that some things do indicate a degree of seriousness that makes this worth kind of talking about. Um, industrial production has fallen sort of on a par. Global trade has you know, actually fallen more rapidly. The stock markets have declined and national budgets including a prediction there from the IMF, um, clearly indicate that things uh, are not looking uh, quite the way the uh, ruling class would want them to look. Um, the WP position, though, has always been to argue against any kind of hysterical sort of uh, response. And in fact, what we've argued at the, is that at this stage, the crisis is not that bad. The capitalism will recover, and um, yes, it will look different, but it will still be capitalism. Overstating the severity of the crisis is not only factually wrong, but also, um, in, co in uh, contradistinction to some people who argue that um, there's a propagandist benefit of motivating people um, to get involved by overhyping the severity of the situation. What we've, what we've argued is that it's actually a better approach to be kind of honest and sober about the situation. That approach, we've argued, is not only more honest and accurate, but also in the long term it's better for the growth of the organisation and for the recruitment of serious quality um, cadre to the, to the, to the organisation. Um, the danger with this approach, of course, is that in taking the, um, the opposite um, approach to the traditional successful prediction of 10 of the last two recessions. <laughs> we'll instead kind of miss this recession as it goes by and we won't have noticed that it happened. Um, we've certainly refrained from writing excitable articles about the sort of imminent, in, um, imminent upsurge of socialist rebellion over, um, over this time and we haven't penned any obituaries for the capitalist system. And that has meant that we've been criticised for missing the significance of the current crisis. Um, I don't think we have been guilty of that. Um, and I think it's, I think we've generally, of course I would because, you know, it's as us. <laughs> I think that we've, uh, we've got the balance about right in terms of what the message should be. Um, but it is with that issue in mind that I'm going to look at some of the stuff around the, um, the recession today. So I'll start by looking at some of the bad news. Any look at the current recession obviously really needs to start with the United States because it's there that the problems began to, uh, began to appear. The subprime mortgage crisis proved to only be the first manifestation of a deeper crisis in the US and world financial system. The subprime mortgage crisis was about bundling together a whole heap of high-risk debt where people had been lent for mortgages and so the promise of owning your own home meant borrowing money um, from the banks on mortgages which had either very low initial interest rates which would then climb on the assumption that incomes would rise or were lent to people whose job security was so poor in, in the uh, context of the, um, the so-called jobless recovery that we'd been going through. Um, that these people were actually very high risk lenders from the point of view of uh, borrowers from the point of view of the banks. So um, the bundling of those debts with more conventional and well secured loans exposed 
far more institutions than just those high risk lenders to these bad loans. And high profile collapses of banks like Lehman Brothers and the massive state bailouts of the world's largest insurance company, AIG, American Insurance Group, and the mortgage giants Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in the United States. Finally revealed to the world the degree to which the banking and financial sector had got out of proportion to the real economy where the real value is produced. The collapse has spread to the industrial economy with big auto companies in crisis and unemployment rising in the United States to 8.9% this April. And, you know, sometimes we look at the photos of what's going on in the States and they are kind of eerily really, um, reminiscent of the last Great Depression. There we have a food queue um, taking place only this year in the US people standing there in the snow, as you can see, um, queuing up for food and other assistance. Mass layoffs in April, um, which mass layoffs in the United States statistics being defined as um, layoffs involving 50 or more workers, reached 2,712 and involved what they euphemistically refer to as the separation of 271,226 workers. That was in April. That's according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. More than 5 million US workers have lost their jobs since the crisis began. General Motors is on the brink of declaring bankruptcy. In fact, I didn't listen to the news yesterday. They may already have done so. Um, it was very, very close to happening. Um, and they are only one of the three big auto companies. One of them's already gone into bankruptcy as well, which is uh, Chrysler, I think. Western Europe was quick to feel the effects um, of the events in the United States. Events like the collapse of Northern Rock in England revealed that the spread of the so-called toxic debt had gone well beyond the American financial sector. But Iceland is obviously the most dramatic European example, or Western European example, of, um, of this crisis having reached beyond the United States and having become a widespread phenomenon. Average incomes in Iceland halved virtually overnight, mortgage, and mortgage holidays for homeowners have only just begun to run out. So the effect of that massive collapse in, in Icelandic incomes is only really going to start to um, seriously affect people's lives um, now. Um, Britain also suffered from the fallout from the Icelandic um, disaster too, because in particular city and town councils, but also retirement funds, had all been encouraged to um, deposit their funds in with the high interest rates that were being offered by Icelandic banks. And incidentally, Iceland has often been compared to New Zealand because um, Iceland put a lot of faith in its young Vikings who could make no mistakes in these things, could take risks and were not like Asia, which had had the, you know, the Asian financial crisis. Icelandic people said, we're not like Asia, we, we, we won't get these things wrong, we have our young Vikings. And, um, and it, it sort of struck me as actually being quite sort of uh, similar to the New Zealand kind of um, myth of, have, of being endowed with a number eight wire mentality that, you know, that says that we can, um, you know, we can always get, thing, get things uh, get through with a sort of a can-do attitude. And of course that was uh, brought back to us with the latest round of the job summit and the, you know, give it a go bro <laughs> campaign that's supposed to be one of the one of the great things that according to the hundred top thinkers in this country is going to save us from um, the worst effects of recession. Um, in the big manufacturing economies of, West, of Western Europe um, things don't look particularly good for business. Uh, um, Opel, which is wholly owned by the aforementioned and bankruptcy threatened General Motors um, is facing being sold off in a fire sale. So a lot of these um, Opal workers won't be particularly um, confident about their futures. And according to Hans Werner Sinn, who's the president of the Munich-based um, IFO, which is the Institute for Economic Research, says that the worst is yet to come. He's predicted that German banks will have to make write-downs equivalent to 90% of their capital. He further predicts that Germany's facing a deflationary spiral other economists, though, such as Axel Weber, the head of Germany's central bank, the Bundesbank, actually sees a threat of inflation for Germany. So nobody 
seems to be able to agree on what the problem they're actually facing is, let alone how to combat it.